Hello, I'm Michael Billups. Welcome to this special edition of Writers in Focus. For the past 30 years, James Taylor has served as the host for Writers in Focus, the longest literary program of its kind anywhere in the country. Well, James is retiring, and it's our pleasure to honor him today by looking back at the best of Writers in Focus. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. James Taylor. Can I call you James? Yes, you may, Michael. Thank <laughs> you very much. Mr. Billups, I should say. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Uh, so, James, how you've done this for 30 years, and how many authors could that possibly be? Close to 600 by 600. my calculations. And I think um, it's the longest running, continuously running literary um, author interview program in the country. I understand people have been driven mad by my continuous <laughs> showing. <you know. laughs> and you've been interviewed. Uh, some incredible authors. Um, can you recall any that uh, stand out in your mind? I had to prepare for this question because there were so many great authors. Uh, James Stickey uh, was one of the most brilliant people I've ever met. He was wonderful. But one does stand out. Who was that? Uh, Dorothy West. Mm -hmm. She was the last surviving member of the Harlem Renaissance. Yes. I had done my research. She was friends with Langston Hughes, who called her the kid. She knew County Cullen. Uh, she knew everybody in this, this amazing scene that I was never taught about right. in high school or college. Right. And I knew that she was 90 years old, had flown down from Martha's Vineyard where she lived, and I expected a, a frail old lady. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, she looked like a frail old lady, but she had the energy mm -hmm. of 20 authors. I don't know if you, do you remember that? Yes, she just I kept, remember. She I kept remember, on yeah. talking. It was like, Unbelievable. Because there was so much, so much history that she had. Everything she said. Right. And the, the Harlem Renaissance was a time when, when there were authors and artists, uh, painters, uh, musicians, all congregating um, in Harlem. And uh, she knew all of those stories yeah. and would, would meet with those people all the time. And there are scholars who have written tomes about why the Harlem Renaissance began, what begat it, what sustained it. And I asked Dorothy West, I said, like, what was the reason for this constellation of genius African-American authors? And she said, they paid us to write. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never forget that. Well, let's go back to the beginning. Um, do you remember how it all started? Yeah, I do, unfortunately. <laughs> um, it was in a bar. No, actually. <laughs> I think um, it was in a bar, was it? <laughs> About 30 and a half years ago, maybe 30 years ago, I began my career as a librarian with the Atlanta Fulton Public Library System. Mm. And I was uh, in a legendary bar here in Atlanta called the Stein Club. And it was Bloom's Day, I think it's uh, June 14th, it's where Leopold Bloom uh, walks around the city of Dublin and James Joyce records. It's, it's a work of fiction, but it's a great novel. And once a year, people around the world read from Ulysses. And I stood up on a table and I read from Ulysses. And a guy, a big guy, Rob Jewett, remember? Rob looked Jewett at me and he said, hey, uh, I'm Rob Jewett. I, uh, I'm a cameraman for a show uh, at the library. You work for the library? And I said, yeah. He says, do you want to host a TV show? And I said, sounds good to me. And that's how it started. I, I couldn't believe it. Right. Well, we had just um, started. We had just uh, actually finished a show called uh, Journeys. Yeah. Uh, that we were doing with another uh, librarian, and uh, she had moved on, and so we wanted to repurpose the show, get it started, keep it going, and um, that's when we started Writers in Focus. I remember um, um, we had another producer at that time, and he came up with the name of Writers in Focus. Actually, we had uh, Writers in Motion, yeah. where you would go out and interview um, authors in different locations. I remember there was one show you did in Cabbage, uh, was it Cabbage Town? Oh God, with uh, Orion, the, the, the famous photographer. Y yes. Rob Jewett and I went over there. Yes, and yes. And hello to Rob Jewett. Can, can I tell you one of my favorite stories though? One sure. Of the, remember the movie Psycho by Alfred Hitchcock? Mm -hmm. So 
Rob Jewett says with the giant handheld cameras of those days, this mm -hmm. is 25, 30 years yeah, ago. Back in the 80s. We go to something called, it wasn't called Dragon Con, but it was a uh, where everybody in the country comes to Atlanta for this you know, like Star Wars kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And um, Rob said, let's cover it. And he introduces me to an author named Robert Block. And then it dawns on me, Robert Block wrote Psycho. Alfred Hitchcock adopted the novel into the movie. Mm -hmm. And as we're talking, Robert Block says, my mentor in life was H.P. Uh, Lovecraft, this great legendary horror writer. And so like, I'm part of history. Uh, that was great. But another time, Rob Jewett took me to the Majestic Diner. Mm -hmm. And we were shooting someone who had just written White Trash Cooking. Yeah. And uh, I think halfway through the interview, Rob said, um, I forgot to put film in the camera. <laughs> What do you want to do? And I said, uh, let's just continue. So that show's never been seen. <laughs> <laughs> I think we must have had him. Uh, we must have done that again because I remember that show. Yeah, right? yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so who was the very first author you interviewed? You know, I have no idea. Mm. I, I just, I, I look back in the records. There are boxes and boxes of the, I think, the three-quarter inch videotape somewhere in the Atlanta mm -hmm. Fulton Public Library. Uh, Bill Montgomery did an, uh, an inventory of, of the, those tapes, and mm -hmm. I still have a, a copy of it. So if the powers to be want to uh, do a retrospective and convert the three-quarter inch videos into what, whatever they do now, uh, that would be interesting. Mm -hmm. The first show, we did a lot of local authors because there weren't a lot of authors living in Atlanta. Right, and, and actually the way that uh, we did the show, um, most of the authors were on tour, and they would be coming through Atlanta doing uh, interviews, press interviews and, and whatnot. And um, a very important part of the show was um, a, a escort uh, by the name of uh, Esther Levine. Yeah. Uh, and she would call and say, um, I've got so-and-so coming, uh, are you interested? And you'd say, okay, well, let's see. And then we would uh, contact their, um, their publicists and uh, try to arrange for them to come here. And most of them were... Um, major authors, yeah. Major authors yeah. And, and very willing to come. And they would always say, to your credit, that this is the best interview on the tour because you actually read the book. We can stop on that. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> because they would go and do so many other yeah, interviews yeah, yeah. and they would have uh, these uh, pre-presented uh, questions from the publicists and so the people would just oh, ask yeah. those questions, but they didn't really have some, uh, a sense of what was in the book and you actually read the book and could actually talk to them intelligently about it. If, and it so thank you, Michael, you, 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 you're more than gracious, but thank you very much. The, well, it's the, the word got around America that there's a guy in Atlanta that will read the book. And with right. Esther Levine's help and some other people, publishers started sending us books. Right. I remember like when you were moving uh, your office from at, uh, from, from the library to here, mm -hmm. I, I forget, you had like tons, tons of books. Of books. The publishers would, you know, please put, go, you know, go, right. let's go do it on Writers mm -hmm. and Focus. And we just couldn't do them all because, right. you know, uh, you, you just could never do them all. Do you remember um, one particular author who really had a great time here? Um, Mary. Mary Wilson? Mary Wilson from The Supremes. The uh, singer with The Supremes? Yes. I fell in love with her. My, my, my wife's in the studio, so I've been married 19 years, but uh, this is before I was married. And uh, this is Mary Wilson of The Supremes. Mm -hmm. And I had read the book. It's called uh, Dream Girl, the life, My Life as a Supreme. And I was just blown away. Mm -hmm. uh, she would. Let me call out some other names and see what sure. your impressions are. Um, Richie Havens. Richie Havens performed at uh, Woodstock. Uh, I can still, I was, n I was not there, uh, but I was close. A lot of my friends went there, and uh, he is the legendary, uh, kind of like a, a folk, soft rock, but filled with vitriol and revolutionary fervor, and uh, yeah, he was amazing. He, right, and he, he, he performed for us uh, that yeah, day, yeah. at the end of the interview. Yeah, that was good. But then I would, ha I would have some bad times and I always I always used to tell my my prospective authors just the way we're sitting uh, like because you make a little small talk before the interview right. I interviewed 
the very famous Atlanta writer, Ann River Siddons, mm -hmm. who is still going strong, lives in Charleston, uh, South Carolina right now. So she came to the studio, and I was in awe of her. She had written like six New York Times bestsellers, probably the biggest living writer in Atlanta at the time, outside of Paul Hempel and Pat Conroy was hanging around. It's like mm -hmm. very young at the time. All of them have been on the show. And so, like, um, I think it was you. No, I'm just, I'm just no, you, you said, James, um, we're not going to start for about 30 minutes. And I said, well, we, let's go outside. I said, Ann, let's go outside and get a cup of coffee. So there was a, st a coffee shop right across the street from the library. Mm -hmm. We sat there for 30 minutes and drank coffee, had a wonderful conversation. And came back to the studio, and I had nothing to say because I had already, <laughs> asked, had the I had already asked her all the questions. Right. So I, I learned a big lesson that day. Like uh, I like the spontaneity of like not really knowing the author, preparing, preparing. Mm -hmm. Let's read as much as I can, do que prepare questions. But once the interview starts, I like it to be spontaneous, like we're doing now. <laughs> yes, very much like we're doing now. Uh, do you remember um, some of the? interviews that maybe didn't go as well as you may have wanted them to because maybe the author didn't want to talk about the book? I think you're <laughs> anticipating my answer, but just yeah. let me try this one. Okay. Uh, Stuart Woods is mm. a hugely successful author uh, from Mansfield, Georgia, uh, started writing novels, uh, and now everything he touches is made into a made-for-TV movie. Mm -hmm. He was friends with the Hollywood elite. And I had read his book and wasn't that impressed. And I said, you know, this sounds like uh, you're writing a script for Hollywood. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a literary novel. Mm -hmm. And I expected him to say, what an insult. And he said, thank you very much. <laughs> he took that as a compliment. And then I, if, if, this the, if this is the author you're thinking of, and then I said, well, Stuart, let's talk about the plot of the book. And he said, I don't want to talk about it <laughs> because he wrote the kind of book where it was a page turner mm -hmm. and he didn't want the audience, he didn't want anything given mm -hmm. away. And so for about 20 minutes, I <laughs> squirmed. <laughs> well, what would you like to talk about? You know? <laughs> and what did you end up talking about? Oh, he had, he, had, he, had, he had sailed a small sailboat across the Atlantic Ocean. Mm -hmm. And even though he looked, he's still alive, he looked like a, um, not the kind of person you'd expect to solo sail across the Atlantic, but he did. He was also a, a, he had a, he piloted his plane and uh, a small plane, and so we we talked about that. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the interview with the uh, television producer, who's done all the sh the shows, um, Silk Stockings? Um, yeah, he just recently died. Yes, uh, Steve is his name. Stephen Cannell. <laughs> Cannell. Stephen Cannell. Yes, that's it. Mm -hmm. And uh, he came in, you know, with a limousine parked in front of the library, and uh, he was older yeah, than me really at the right, time, and I thought I was old, but he was stuff. built solid. You could tell yeah. he'd been lifting I, I weights all his life, no, and he just exuded Hollywood power and money, and we instantly like, didn't like each reading. other because uh, <laughs> he was just intimidating. And it was, you know, six two, and I'm like five eleven and a half, six feet. And uh, but he did all these legendary shows. He used yes. to do the the Rockford Files. Right. He, he directed, produced, right. wrote, and uh, right. you have a good memory if you remember right. that one. That was that was a tough well, one. There's for some me. that kind of stand out. Uh, can I tell you one story? Sure. It's, this could be. I don't know if. It's out of litigation, but remember that there was a woman president of Morris Brown College. This is 10, 15 years ago, I'm not sure. She showed up in a limousine with about three or four, maybe five sycophants, attendants. I said, this is very strange for a president of a university or a college to have this kind of care. And she came in, with very imperious. We had a great interview, and then one of her people invited me to lunch at Morris Brown College. And I had lunch accompanied by a professional pianist. And the food was, you know, French gourmet food. And soon thereafter, Morris Brown went bankrupt. And she had been embezzling money. Uh, like, right, she had done do you remember that? some issues. I do remember that. Was that. Incredible. Mm -hmm. that was incredible. That was incredible. How about uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin? One of my favorite people in the world, not only just as a writer, but uh, let me let me get this off my chest. There's there's absolutely no correlation between the quality of a book and the personality and character of the person who writes it. I've learned that after 30 years. I mean, some of the most brilliant books are written by horrible people. Mm. 
But she was one of the most wonderful people I've ever met. As, as Norman Mailer once said of Doris Kearns Goodwin, I've met smarter people than you, I've met nicer people than you, but I've never met a smarter, more nicer person than you. She's on TV all the time. And she wrote a book on, uh, yeah, it was about Lincoln. And Steven Spielberg made that book right, into a movie, right, right, Team of right. Rivals. Mm -hmm. And she was, she was unbelievable. What about uh, one of my favorites that uh, actually came a few times to be with us, uh, E. Lynn Harris? You know, uh, my heart goes out to E. Lynn Harris. Uh, he would always say that you and I helped him with his career. He was, just prior to his death, well, he was one of the most successful around. writers in America. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, well, he was selling was books out of his, the trunk of his car to barber shops and beauty salons out through Atlanta. And, uh, and then he came on our show and I gave him the Taylor bump. No, I'm kidding, I'm well, kidding. hey, you know, you have the Oprah <laughs> effect on on authors, on local authors. Right. But he was, mm -hmm. a, remember, remember what a nice guy he was? Yeah, he was great. He yeah. was great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he was always happy to come back and, and do his books. Yeah. Another name, um, Clark Howard. Clark Howard is still on TV, still on radio, and he's still as cheap <laughs> as, as a person as you'd ever want to meet. He was late for the interview. Because right. he refused to take his, he didn't own a car at the time. I think he was a millionaire at the time. Oh yeah. But his taxi cab <laughs> was late. No, no, Marta was late. It was like something with the Marta, with the bus. But he took a bus to the interview. Another, my, my wife loves this story. Uh, Raymond Andrews hmm. is now a famous, famous Georgia writer. Several of his books are on the list of all books that Georgians should read from the uh, Georgia Center for the Book. And I asked him to uh, come in for an interview, not knowing that I met him at, uh, at a restaurant in Atlanta and not knowing that he lived in Athens. He was living with his brother, Benny Andrews, the, the great oh, artist. Right, yeah. right, yeah. And so Raymond came in and I said, well, how did you get here? He said, I took the dog and uh, being, you know, me, I said, well, what is that? He said, the Greyhound, you know, he took a bus from Athens to Atlanta just to be on the show. That made me feel great. That's incredible. Um, Pearl Kleeg. Can I tell you a story about Pearl? Sure. We are very good friends right now, but we met about 25 years ago. And this was in the studio. You were, I remember that exactly. You were uh, the producer, you're the director. I mean, you were, you, whatever, whatever success I've had is due to Michael Billups. There's, no. There is no, <laughs> but, but he's the one. <laughs> there is no question about that. So there I am face to face with Pearl Clegg, and I had done my research. Little did I know that Pearl was in her, and she'll admit it, she was in her angry mode at the time mm. about white people and life in general. And uh, she called me a racist. And I said, presumably I'm a racist because I'm white. And you're probably going to call me a sexist because I'm a man. And she said, you're very smart too, you know? <laughs> and so after four interviews, in the last 25 years, we hug each other. And she, every time she writes a book, she'll either email me or I'll call her and say, you want to do another interview? And Pearl says, James, I'd love to, I'd love to. But times have changed. Mm. Mm. What about um, Eric L. Haney, the uh, creator of The Unit? I was with uh, a very famous uh, attorney uh, who works for Fulton County, last name of Rucker. And there's a woman who's producing this, this show as we speak who's married to this guy. Mm. And uh, Mr. Rucker it was a big fan of the unit. I knew Eric Haney even before he got a, was associated with the unit. He was with Delta Force, and he had written a book called Delta Force, the, the organization that is not supposed to exist. But uh, remember when Carter was president and uh, Carter sent in a team of commandos to uh, extricate some hostages in, in Iran or Iraq. I, you know, I'm getting old, Somewhere but uh, the, the helicopter, it was a failure. Right. It could have, I think it cost <coughs> Carter the presidency. Yeah. Haney was there as, a, as before Delta, T, before uh, SEAL Team 6, there was Delta for us. And uh, he's from North Georgia, I used to call it. I come from a third world country called North Georgia. <laughs> and just being with him and having him tell me stories about what it's really like yeah. to be and a commando, so uh, to drop a drop girl. out of a helicopter She's with your weaponry her, and uh, your her, friends. and uh, wow, I, it's, I still get shivers thinking about it. Yeah. 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 We did him twice. Go to the Talking about uh, aircraft, do you remember John Nance? 
your your memory's better than mine. Yeah, he's on one of the major networks yeah. almost every other day. He's an he's aircraft on. expert, right. and uh, he had written a novel, right. and uh, I loved him. Mm -hmm. He was a great example of a good book and a really nice guy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And very knowledgeable. And, yeah, yeah. Um, whenever there's a, a crash to be investigated, uh, the networks always call on him to uh, yeah. to comment. Yeah. What about um, Byron Pitts? One of my favorites. Uh, he was a correspondent for CBS 60 Minutes. And my, you're jogging my memory. This is, wow, what a feeling. Uh, he was dyslexic as a boy, uh, but he wanted to be a news commentator. Rose up through the ranks in CBS. Uh, you could, he was on CBS 60 Minutes as mm -hmm. one of their standard people. Right. Uh, I think he, now he's with and NBC or uh, ABC, Ula. Her name is Ula. and uh, you meet these yes. people, and, uh, and he's, so Ula was, to tell you how, how fate was, he's at the top uh, of his Ula craft, was the first but he was so when generous, and I'll remember that uh, the, the whole staff came out, everybody associated with FGTV, and he just sat with everybody and said, thank you, thank you, tips, and like the how to do this and how to do that. And, and Another a great guy. And I remember uh, that day when he, he had just flown in and had been up for hours and hours yeah, yeah. and it was very tired but was very gracious to uh, meet with everybody on the staff. Unbelievable. Yeah. Great guy. So what has all of this Writers in Focus experience meant to you in your career, in your life? Uh, you've met a lot of great people. Just exactly what does it mean to you? That's a good question. Uh, I, I am recently retired and retirement to me is like uh, getting married for the first time. It's exhilarating, but you don't know what's going to happen. It's, uh, but 30 years of interviewing authors uh, has kept me, not anymore, but it's kept me sharp as a tack. It's mm -hmm. like being in graduate school for 30 years, mm -hmm. because every author I would meet, I would read the, as many books right, by you, them as possible. Right, you'd have to do a lot of research. Yeah, I mean, ladies yeah. and gentlemen, he's the greatest researcher ever. Uh, that's not he's really, the not really. Right. Ever. <laughs> But it's funny, Michael, it's, uh, it, I can, if you don't read the book, it shows. Mm -hmm. And if you read the book, the author knows it. You could be right. talking about anything, but the author knows you've read their works. Mm -hmm. And what I've learned is that uh, I've learned a lot about writing, learned a lot about publishing, uh, that I don't know where talent comes from, that luck has so much to do with uh, uh, getting published and being successful. Uh, my wife used to think that I had a magic touch because I had an inside look at the world of publishing and mm -hmm. writing. It's all luck. I remember talking to a very successful author now who was returning from a book fair in Germany, the Munich Book Festival, uh, and his name will come to me in a second, but he was sitting beside someone and the guy said, what do you do? And the guy says, well, I'm a writer. And the, the guy says, well, I'm an agent. On, the, on an airplane. So I used to teach a course in pu publishing for the Atlanta Fulton Public Library. And if you're a writer, always keep your avenues open, open, open. If you're at a party and you're having a beer, a glass of wine, Coca-Cola, and someone says, what do you do? I'm a writer. Have that book on you. Mm. Have a card ready for you. Mm. The, the world of publishing, world of writing is, is uh, I've, that's what I've learned about. Mm. And notice, um, Does that one, make any sense? Well, yeah, it makes a lot of sense to me. And uh, um, I know when you would interview the authors, you would ask them, um, "How do you, you know, what 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 makes a what makes you a writer?" Yeah, and, and yeah. I think all of them had the same answer, and basically it was, "You write, right? And you write every day. Right. You know, you can't call yourself a writer if you don't write exactly every day." And then I was that's that's like the. the the, the question 101, like, you know, like, that's what amateurs ask, but I, that's my favorite question. Mm -hmm. Like, why did you write this book? Mm -hmm. Out of, you could have done any, you could have mowed the lawn that day, but you started writing a book. Generally, the an, among the great writers and the good writers, the question, the answer is invariably, because I had to, mm. because I had to. It's, a, it's an obsession. And another thing they would say is that, uh, especially the, um, the, the fiction writers would talk about how the characters would would start to write their own stories. They would, yeah. uh, once the, the character was created, they would start to live and, and, and walk around yeah. and interact with each other. And so the book really kind of wrote itself. 
Ask so, me if I want to write a book. No. Well, <laughs> are you going to continue reading books? Oh, uh, yes. I, I love to read. Okay. I love to read. Mm -hmm. And you don't think you'll ever write a book? I would, it's, my wife is the writer in, in the marriage, and she's ex extremely talented, and I wanted to finish some novels in the works. But I would write, but even the best writers will tell you. Like some writers, it comes naturally, and their novels are like four and 500 and 800 pages. Mm -hmm. They write 10 pages a day for a year and then try to edit it. And other writers who are equally as good every sentence is an excruciating exercise, mm. sitting down and like squeezing out a good sentence or a good paragraph. So there is no, you know, it's work. Writing is, it, it, to be a good writer is the best work. Mm. So what's next for James Taylor in your retirement? Uh, let's see, I'm going to Tybee Island uh, and on Monday and frolic in the surf. Oh, I'm going to relax. I'm going to take care of my 98-year-old father oh, up in Massachusetts. Oh, fantastic. Want to uh, establish a friendship with uh, this old producer that I know, that named Michael Billups, mm -hmm. who was so gracious to be here today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I got to tell you, it, it's been great reconnecting with you and um, reliving some of those old experiences with the show. Uh, it was a great ride for me as well. It's, and it's just, it's, it's a really good feeling to be associated with something as historic as Writers in Focus. And we just want to thank you for being with us and thank you for all you did. Thank you, for, Michael. I couldn't have done this without you. I mean, you were, this is the truth. I mean, you, you kept me on my toes. You were, you were a taskmaster. I, I knew nothing about television. You taught me all of that stuff. And uh, anything that I get from this is because of you. I, I appreciate that. Well, I guess the only thing left to say is that we are a great team. <laughs> Thank you, James. Thank you. Thank you. This has been a special edition of Writers in Focus, and ladies and gentlemen, we thank you for being with us.